Let us now proceed with the second part of our lesson in cryptography. Let us first discuss the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption. So for symmetric encryption, basically what's happening is this one. You have a plain text. You will use a key to encrypt it okay? so that you will have a cipher text. And then using the same key, you will use it to decrypt the message, to get the original message. So what are the examples of symmetric encryption? So actually, the different ciphers that we discussed um, in the first part are all symmetric encryptions. Okay? So meaning to say, if someone has the key, he can use the same key to decrypt the message, right? Whereas for asymmetric encryption, you use a key to encrypt it. You call that a public key. But only the receiver has the key to decrypt it. Okay, so um, I, will, I will explain this later. Whose public key? Um, should we use but anyway the point here is that whoever will receive the message so in this case there's person a and person b person a wants to receive a message to person b so what person a would do is to give um, his public key to person b and person b would be able to send her a message using that public key but only person a can read the message because she will use another key to read it she will use her private key you can think of it as if um, you have your email your email address is like your public key you announce it to everybody right so um everyone can send you an email because they know your email address however you are the only one who can read your email because you have your password for your email okay that's just an analogy with this public key and private key so to understand more about this um, symmetric and asymmetric asymmetric encryption. Let's watch the following video. Up until the 1970s, cryptography had been based on symmetric keys. That is, the sender encrypts their message
Okay, let me illustrate that public key and um, private key. Although, of course, this is a very simple example. This is not really um, asymmetric because everybody knows the inverse of this function. But anyway, just to illustrate it to you. So, for example, our plain text is 7. Our key is 328. So, meaning to say, our key it, to encrypt a message is we multiply the number by 328. So, that means that our ciphertext would then be 7 times 328. So, that's 2,296. So, we say that our public key is multiplying the plain text by 328. So, it's as if you can tell everybody that, okay, if you want to send me a message, here's how you encrypt the message. Multiply it by 328, okay? And then, to decode it, your private key should be the inverse operation of your public key. And of course, what's the inverse of multiplying it by 328 of course the inverse of that is multiplying it by its reciprocal so we say that this is your private key but of course this is not um, a very good example because if everybody knows what your that your public key is multiplication by 328 they will also know that the decryption key is just multiplying it by 1 over 328. Okay, so in real life, the private key should be difficult to determine if somebody knows your public key. We will discuss that later. This is just to illustrate to you the meaning of public and private key. To see how inverse keys could work, let's do a simplified example with colors. How could Bob send Alice a specific color without Eve, who is always listening, intercepting it? The inverse of some color is called a complementary color, which when added to it produces white, undoing the effect of the first color. In this example, we assume that mixing colors is a one-way function because it's fast to mix colors and output a third and it's much slower to undo. Alice first generates her private key by randomly selecting a color, say red. Next, assume Alice uses a secret color machine to find the exact complement of her red and nobody else has access to this. This results in cyan, which she sends to Bob as her public key. Let's say Bob wants to send a secret yellow to Alice. He mixes this with her public color and sends the resulting mixture back to Alice. Now, Alice adds her private color to Bob's mixture. This undoes the effect of her public color, leaving her with Bob's secret color. Notice Eve has no easy way to find Bob's yellow since she needs Alice's private red to do so. Okay, so let's now see how RSA crypto system works. Okay, so what is RSA? It is actually the um, encryption, decryption system that we use nowadays. So the first thing that we need to do is our trapdoor function. Okay, so take note that a trapdoor function is a function that is easy to compute forwards but difficult to compute backwards right because of course we do not want our the people who will send us a message to have difficult time in encrypting their message sort of that so anyway in the video with alice and bob so recall there that for alice and then bob what is the private key of Alice. Her private key is red, but her public key is cyan. 
okay? So what happens there is that she will publish her public key, Cyan. So everybody knows that in order to um, encrypt a message to Alice, they have to add Cyan to their color, right? And take note here that this private thread, only Alice is the person who knows this color. So what happened there is person B, Bob, sent uh, what color was that? Yellow, right? Yellow. But um, he added cyan, okay? And it resulted in green, correct? So Bob sent Alice green, correct? So when Alice received green, of course, she knows that this is just the encrypted color. This is not the original color, correct? So what Alice did was, so for Alice to get the original message, so she mixed green with her private key, red, okay? Recall that green is yellow plus cyan okay so this one green is yellow plus cyan and then we add red correct so add red but remember that cyan and red they cancel each other correct okay so this one gets cancelled out so she now knows that Bob sent her a yellow. Okay, so any eavesdropper would not be able to encrypt the, or the plain color of Bob because they need to have access to Alice's private color, which is red. Okay, now the next question is what would be the trapdoor function that we will use in order to encrypt and decrypt our messages. Let's watch the following video. The solution was found by another British mathematician and cryptographer, Clifford Cox. Cox needed to construct a special kind of one-way function called a trapdoor one-way function. This is a function that is easy to compute in one direction, yet difficult to reverse unless you have special information called the trap door. For this, he turned to modular exponentiation, which we introduced as clock arithmetic in the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, as follows. Take a number, raise it to some exponent, divide by the modulus, and output the remainder. This can be used to encrypt a message as follows. Imagine Bob has a message which is converted into a number, m. He then multiplies his number by itself, e times, where e is a public exponent. Then he divides the result by a random number, n, and outputs the remainder of the division. This results in some number, c. This calculation is easy to perform. However, given only c, e, and n, it is much more difficult to determine which M was used because we'd have to resort to some form of trial and error. So this is our one-way function that we can apply to M, easy to perform but difficult to reverse. It is our mathematical lock. Now, what about the key? The key is the trap door some piece of information that makes it easy to reverse the encryption. We need to raise C to some other exponent, say D, which will undo the initial operation applied to M and return the original message M. So both operations together is the same as M to the power of E, all raised to the power of D, which is the same as M to the power of E times D. E is the encryption, D is the decryption. Therefore, we need a way for Alice to construct E and D, which makes it difficult for anyone else to find D. 
This requires a second one-way function which is used for generating D. And for this, he looked back to Euclid. The second tool that we use is prime factorization. Now, take note that for our uh, raptor function, we want something that is easy to compute. For one-way direction, we want it to be easy to compute, but to reverse it, it has to be difficult. However, of course, for getting the product, it's easy to get the product, but it's difficult to get the factors. Let's watch the following video to see how um, prime factorization is used in RA in RSA. Over 2,000 years ago, Euclid showed every number has exactly one prime factorization, which we can think of as a secret key. It turns out that prime factorization is a fundamentally hard problem. Let's clarify what we mean by easy and hard by introducing what's called time complexity. We have all multiplied numbers before, and each of us has our own rules for doing so in order to speed things up. If we program a computer to multiply numbers, it can do so much faster than any human can. Here is a graph that shows the time required for a computer to multiply two numbers. And of course, the time required to find the answer increases as the numbers get larger. Notice that the computation time stays well under one second, even with fairly large numbers. Therefore, it is easy to perform. Now compare this to prime factorization. If someone told you to find the prime factorization of 589, you will notice the problem feels harder. No matter what your strategy, it will require some trial and error until you find a number which evenly divides 589. After some struggle, you will find 19 times 31 is the prime factorization. If you were told to find the prime factorization of 437,231, you'd probably give up and get a computer to help you. This works fine for small numbers, though if we try to get a computer to factor larger and larger numbers, there is a runaway effect. The time needed to perform the calculations increases rapidly as there are more steps involved. As the numbers grow, the computer needs minutes, then hours, and eventually it will require hundreds or thousands of years to factor huge numbers. We therefore say it is a hard problem due to this growth rate of time needed to solve it. So factorization is what Cox used to build the trapdoor solution. Step one, imagine Alice randomly generated a prime number over 150 digits long, call this P1. Then a second random prime number roughly the same size, call this P2. She then multiplies these two primes together to get a composite number N, which is over 300 digits long. This multiplication step would take less than a second. We could even do it in a web browser. Then she takes the factorization of n, p1 times p2, and hides it. Now, if she gave n to anyone else, they would have to have a computer running for years to find the solution. The third tool that we are going to use is the phi function. Now, what is the phi function? The phi of an integer counts the positive integers up to n that do not share any common factor with n. So, for example, let's have 5 of 4. Okay, so let's look at the numbers which are less than 4. We have 1, 2, 3, 4. So, we want the numbers that do not share any common factor with 4. So what are those numbers? 1 and 3, correct? 1 and 3. So there are two of them, understand? So what if it's 5 of 7? So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. How many numbers, oops, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have included 7. And also here, we should not include 4 because it says that, ah, yeah, up to n. We can, in, up 
to n, actually, n should not be included. Okay, so this one should be, counts the positive integer less than n, okay? Um, let, let, let me write that down. It should be less than n, okay? So, for phi of 7, take note that all of these numbers do not share a common factor with 7. Why is that? Because 7 is a prime number. Alright? So, 5 of 7 is equal to 6. In the next video, we will discuss the different properties of the phi function. So, let me just give um, like a summary of what we will see in the next video. So, what's from, from here, we saw that phi of a prime number is actually equal to the prime number minus 1, right? And also, we will see that if you have phi of AB, it's e if you have phi of a product, it's equal to the product of the phi of those numbers. Now, take note that this is true when Ah, this one should be B. This is true when A and B are prime numbers. But the nice thing about this property is that, remember that prime numbers are the building blocks of numbers, right? All numbers can be written in its prime factorization. So that's why we use tool number two prime factorization. Anyway, to learn more about the phi function, let us watch this video. Step 2. Cox needed to find a function which depends on knowing the factorization of n. For this, he looked back to work done in 1760 by Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler. Euler continued to investigate properties of numbers, specifically the distribution of prime numbers. One important function he defined is called the phi function. It measures the breakability of a number. So given a number, say n, it outputs how many integers are less than or equal to n that do not share any common factor with n. For example, if we want to find the phi of 8, we look at all values from 1 to 8, then we count how many integers 8 does not share a factor greater than 1 with. Notice 6 is not counted because it shares a factor of 2, while 1, 3, 5, and 7 are all counted because they only share a factor of 1. Therefore, 5 of 8 equals 4. What's interesting is that calculating the phi function is hard except in one case. Look at this graph. It is a plot of values of phi over integers from 1 to 1000. Now, notice any predictable pattern. The straight line of points along the top represent all the prime numbers. Since prime numbers have no factors greater than 1, the phi of any prime number, p, is simply p minus 1. To calculate phi of 7, a prime number, we count all integers except 7, since none of them share a factor with 7. Phi of 7 equals 6. So if you're asked to find phi of 21,377, a prime number, you would only need to subtract 1 to get the solution, 21,376. Phi of any prime is easy to compute. This leads to an interesting result based on the fact that the phi function is also multiplicative. That is, phi a times b equals phi a times phi b. If we know some number n is the product of two primes, p1 and p2, then phi of n is just the value of phi for each prime multiplied together, or p1 minus 1 times p2 minus 1. We now have a trapdoor for solving phi. If you know the factorization for n, then finding phi n is easy. For example, the prime factorization of 77 is 7 times 11, so 5 of 77 is 6 times 10, 60.
Step 3. How to connect the phi function to modular exponentiation. For this, he turned to Euler's theorem, which is a relationship between the phi function and modular exponentiation as follows. m to the power of phi n is congruent to 1 mod n. This means you could pick any two numbers such that they do not share a common factor. Let's call them m and n. Say m equals 5 and n equals 8. Now, when you raise m to the power of phi n, or 4, and divide by n, you will always be left with 1. Okay, so what we want to do now is to find the private key. How do we get the private key if we know the public key is 8? So here, public key is 8. We want to find B, okay? So, um, let us recall that since E is our public key, that means our message M raised to E mod N is equal to, let's say, that's the ciphertext. And to decrypt it, what we want to do is raise C to a certain exponent d such that when we compute it mod n we get the original message m all right and what we that this means that if we substitute c c here is equivalent to m raised to e now take note class that this mod n you can think of it as just um, equality, meaning to say you can substitute also and everything happens under modulo n. So, I will just substitute c is equal to m raised to e. Okay? So, I will write m raised to e raised to d mod n. But from loss of exponents, what do we do here? We multiply the exponents. Hence, we have m raised to e d mod n. Okay, this is what we want to achieve, right? If we know our e, we want to find what d is. Now, for this, we need to use Euler's theorem. What does Euler's theorem say? It states that if I have two numbers, m and n, that do not share common factors, then if I have m raised to phi of n mod n, it should be equal to 1. This is shown in the previous slide, right? So what will we do here? So first, I will raise both sides to k. Alright, so remember that modulo is just like an equation. Whatever you do on one side, you can also do on the other side. And then you just copy the modulo. So the left-hand side becomes m. k here is an integer. k times phi of n is also equal to 1 because 1 raised to any integer is equal to 1. Next, since I want to have an m on this side, I will multiply m on both sides of the equation. Using loss of exponents, what do we do with the exponent 1 here and exponent k5 of n? We add, correct? So we have m. 1 plus k phi n mod n is equal to 1. 
if you look at this, this means that we want the exponent ab to be equal to 1 plus k phi of n. So that means d is equal to 1 plus k phi n over e. Okay? So that is how you compute your d. But the question is, how do we find k? So in order to find k, we will use a computer. Okay? We actually, we can use Excel to find k. Let me illustrate that. Let's now let me illustrate what we what I have shown in the previous slide. So first we will take two large primes, P1 and P2, and compute their product. Okay, so let's say that we take here P1 to be 43 and P2 to be equal to 59. Why do we want our primes to be large? Of course, because if the primes are small, then it will be easy for someone to get the factorization of your um, capital N. Because remember that we want to keep this as a secret. Because if we know the the if we know our N and P1 and P2 are very very large, then N would be very large. And it will be difficult for someone to compute P1 and P2. Although, of course, in our example, P1 and P2 here are not that large enough. In real life, P1 and P2 are really, really large, like 24-digit number, something like that. Okay, but just to illustrate to you, we will we, 43 and 59 are already large enough. So anyway, our n here, which is the product p1 times p2, is equal to 2537. And then, we choose a number e less than n and relatively prime to n. What does relatively prime mean? And relatively prime to n. What does that mean? It means that e and n do not share common factors. So in this case, we choose E to be equal to 13. Definitely, they do not share any common factors because the factors of N are 43 and 59, whereas E is equal to 13, right? Okay, so now that we have our E, we want to compute our D. Let us recall that D is given by, so D is equal to 1 plus K phi of N over E. Now take note that what is our phi of N? Phi of n, n is p1 times p2, but this is phi of, phi of phi1, phi2. But the phi of a prime number is p1 minus 1, then this is p2 minus 1. So this is our phi of n. The question is, how do we find K? So let's do that. Okay, so for this one, we will use trial and error. So let's say this is your K. One, two, then let's just drag. Okay, let's say up to 25. And then for our formula, we want 1 plus... K, we do not know, we are looking at the possible value, times phi of n, which in this case is 2436, then 
divided by e, which is 13. Okay? So we will see which k would give us, oops, which one would give us an integer. There you go, 5. So that's our answer. k should be equal to 5. We can now compute our d. Let us now make, um, find our d. Our d was 1 plus, let me just write that down, k phi of n over e. And then our k was found to be 5, right? And then our phi of n is phi of 43 times phi of 59, so that's 42 times 58, so that's why we got 2436, right? So 2436 over 13, and in our Excel, the answer was 937. So therefore, our public key is an E, which in this case is 253713. And then our private key is N D. D is for decryption. So that's 2537. 937. Let's now see, see this in action. Let's encrypt using the RSA. So the first step, we translate the message into a sequence of integers. And then, meaning to say, we make A to be equal to 0, 0, B to be 0, 1, ah, yeah, C, 0, 2, and so on, up to Z, 25, okay? And then we group the integers together to form large integers, each representing a block of letters, and then transform the message M to the encrypted version C using our formula m raised to e, our public key, mod n is equal to c. And then, of course, to retrieve the original message, we decrypt it by using this formula. Okay? So, for example, we want to send the message stop. Okay, so first, step one, we translate this into a sequence of integers. So from there, stop would be equal to this number, 18, that's for S-T-O-P. And then step two says that we group the integers to form even larger integers. So in this case, we group 18, 19 together and then 14, 15 together. Okay? Next, we now encrypt 18, 19, and 14, 15 using our formula. We raise it to E13 and then to modulo N, 2537. And also 14, 15 raised to 13 mod 2537 is equal to 218. So to compute the modulo of very large numbers, you just go to wolframalpha.com and then here, you type what you want, 18, 19. Okay, and then when you want to raise it, use that. And then 13 mod, actually I already typed it earlier, mod 2537. And then press enter and there you go. You will see the result 2018. Now, let's now decrypt it. So we, when we want to decrypt 2081, 2182, 
we just use the formula. So this time, instead of um, raising it to 13, we now raise it to our decryption D, 937. So you get 1819 and this one also you get 1415. Again, you can compute these numbers using wolframalpha.com and therefore you get stop. Okay, so anyway, so RSA is used everywhere, it's actually used in um, online banking, everywhere, all our um, internet. Um, transactions, they're encrypted using RSA. So, for example, in this case, look, oh, there's RSA encryption. Alright? Now, let's um, find what is the role of mathematics during the World War. So, during the World War, there was um, a cipher machine called the German Enigma. So, this is that machine. Um, they use that uh, to send messages, of course, to their troops, what they will do. And the Allies wanted to decipher this, um, this code that they send using this machine. Um, every day, every 24 hours, they change the key. So it's really difficult to, to decode it, even the, bri the brightest of all mathematicians. So there is a guy whose name was Alan Turing. And he made a machine that decrypted this code. Um, I will post a video um, on YouTube on how this machine worked and how Alan Turing was able to decipher it using his machine also. Next, let's go to steganography. What is steganography? It is the technique of hiding secret data within an ordinary non-secret file or message in order to avoid detection. And the secret data is then extracted at its destination. I will show you how to um, hide your data from an image. Let's watch this video. Hey guys, welcome to another Gaging Gadgets tutorial video. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to hide any file inside of an image file so that it makes it harder for people to find and it's more private. This tutorial will require a Windows computer and you will have to have some sort of compression software. I'll be using 7-Zip, so check the description because I'll have a link down there. It's a free software that's highly trusted. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I'll be doing is just creating a folder on my desktop just so it's easier to find these files when we're doing this through command prompt. So what we're gonna do is just right click on the desktop and go to new and then select folder. I'm just gonna name it test. And now what we need to do is add the image that we're gonna be hiding the files in and the file that we're gonna be hiding in the image to this folder. So I have an image here on my computer, I'm just gonna copy it. And then I'm gonna open up the new folder that we created on our desktop and I'm just gonna paste it in there. I recommend changing the name of the image to something very short and easy. I'm just gonna name it image. And then for this tutorial, I'll be hiding a text file and I'm gonna put some numbers in there to represent some sort of transaction or banking information, but none of it will be real. So what I'm gonna do is just create a quick text file by right-clicking on the folder, going to new, and then going to text document. So I'm just gonna name it text. Then I'm gonna open up the text file and just add some information to it. All right, so I have my fake banking information in this. I'm just gonna save it. So now what we need to do with the file we're gonna hide in the image is compress it. So I'm gonna select the text file, then I'm going to right click it and go to 7-zip and I'm gonna select add to text.zip. So it's gonna create that quick zip file. Now we have a text.zip file. So now we're ready to get into where we can actually hide this file inside of our image. We have our image and we have our compressed file that we're gonna hide inside of that image. So now what we need to do is open up CMDB and we can easily do that by simply selecting the start button in the bottom left. It looks like the Windows logo and then just start searching CMD. So as you can see, command prompt came up. So now when we have command prompt open, what we need to do is direct command prompt to the folder that we created where we put the image file and the text file. And if you use the same location as me, 
just with a folder on your desktop. It's very easy. All we need to do is type cmd space desktop forward slash and then the name of the folder. So for me, it's test. And there you go. We have cd space desktop slash test. So if I press enter, now as you can see, cmd is showing that we are in the test folder. So if I type dir, it'll give me a directory of all the different items that are in that folder. So you can see our image file, you can see the original text document, and then the new zip file that we created with the text document. And this is also great because it gives us the full file name, including the extension of all the files in that folder. We'll need that later. So now we have command prompt located in the folder containing all of our files. We need to type one line of code and then we'll be done. And if you get lost, check the description. I'll have a detailed write-up down there, including what we're typing into CMD so that you don't have to squint at the screen to figure it out. So what I'm going to type in is copy space forward slash B space, the name of the image file. So image dot PNG plus symbol, and then the name of the zipped file. So text dot zip. Now what we're going to do is do a space and then we're going to create a new image file. So this is going to be image two dot PNG. So basically what we're doing is telling it to copy the file and do that by combining these two files, the image, then the zip file. And what we're going to do is output a new image file. So I'm going to select enter and it's going to tell us that we have one file that's been copied. So now when we go back to our test folder, you can see that we now have image two. If I click on that, it's just going to open up the same image as image one. There's no difference there. But if I open up that image two with seven zip, so what we're going to do is we're going to open up seven zip on our computer, the file manager, and you want to point the directory up here to the desktop and then the test folder. What you need to do is open up image two right here and we can see the text document. We can even open it up and you'll see the text document open up with the routing number and account number. Now, if you did that with a video file or anything like that, those will open up using that method as well. One other thing I want to point out is the size of the image will go up by the size of the file that's being hidden in that image. So the original image file is going to be 21.4 kilobytes. And as you can see, because it was a small text file that was compressed, it went up by 0.2 kilobytes right here. So if you were to add a very large file to an image, it's going to be very easy for someone who's looking for it to identify that image as something suspicious because the image will be very large. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're doing this. All right, so that's how you hide any file inside of an image file. If you have any questions about this, leave a comment below. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If you'd like to see more tutorial videos, check the links in the description. If this video helped you, give it a thumbs up. And please consider subscribing to my channel, Gaging Gadget, for more gadget reviews and tech tutorials. Thank you so much for watching. Let us now go to digital signatures. So to learn more about digital signatures, let's look at this video. Digital signatures. Digital signatures are one of the main aspects of ensuring the security and integrity of the data that is recorded onto a blockchain. Similar to the handwritten signatures of the physical world, digital signatures are used to bind a person or entity to digital data. To understand how a digital signature is created, let's suppose that Bob wants to send a digitally signed document to Alice. To illustrate this example, we will use a document to be certified, a hash algorithm, a digest based on the content of the document, a public key, a private key, and its algorithms. Bob has two keys appearing in the form of random numbers and letters, a private key and a public key. A private key should always remain private, but in order to digitally sign a document for Alice, Bob needs to share his public key with her. She will need it later on to verify the authenticity of the document and the signature. When the document is sent, its content is run through a hashing algorithm. The algorithm creates a unique array of numbers and letters called a digest. The digest is then encrypted with Bob's private key, which finally outputs the digital signature of the document. A digital signature is a combination of the content of the document it certifies and the author's private key. But how can Alice verify the authenticity of the document? Any variation in the content of the document or in Bob's private key would create a different signature. So. Alice can use the document and its digital signature 
to reverse the process and verify its legitimacy. Alice can run the document through the same hashing algorithm that Bob used previously, which will output a digest. If the document is untampered, the digest should be exactly the same. Additionally, as Bob ran the digest through his private key algorithm to create the digital signature, Alice can decrypt the digital signature with Bob's public key algorithm to also get a digest. If the signature is untampered, the digest should also be exactly the same. Finally, Alice will have two digests, one based on the digital signature and the other one based on the content of the document. If both digests match, then Alice can be sure that the message hasn't changed in transit and verify that Bob is actually the author. It is in this way that the digital signatures are one of the key parts of securing data on the blockchain and guaranteeing immutability. All right, so let me just show you the how digital signatures are um, generated um, in a slower version. So anyway, this is just from the video. So we have Bob and this is his document. And then he uses a hashing algorithm to make a digest. This digest here is just like text, okay? And then he uses his private key with this digest. So remember that digest plus private key equals your digital signature. And then, okay, so this is how Alice will now ident um, authenticate that it is really from Bob. So there are two steps that she needs to do. Step one, okay, she will run the document because Alice will receive the document together with the digital signature. So first, she will run the document on the hashing algorithm. I will show you later um, a hashing algorithm, SHA-256. Anyway, so she will run the document to the hashing algorithm and she will then get this hashed um, data. This is called the hashed data. This is hashed data. She got this from the document. And then, next, Alice will now get Bob's public key, this one, public key, because remember that Bob um, sent his public key for anyone who wants um, uh, yeah, anyway, Bob's public key is for everybody, right? So, what Alice would do is she will get Bob's public key and this digital signature. Now, let us recall that the digital signature is actually a combination of the, that's hash data, hash data that was generated by Bob Wright plus Bob's private key, okay? So what will happen, class, if um, Alice will add, right, will use Bob's public key? So the public key and private key will now cancel each other. So that's why Alice will now get another hash data. So what she will do is she will compare the hash data that she got from the document lang, let's say the, a word file, and she will get the hash data she will get from the digital signature. So let me write that for the step two. From the digital signature plus the public key, she will also generate a hash data. And then she will compare this two, and this two should be the same if there is no tampering of the data. Okay, but if these two hash data are not the same, that means that 
yeah, it's not authentic. Okay, I will now illustrate to you a hashing algorithm. Okay, so what you do, you just go to Google and type SHA-256. Then you can go to this one, cryptographic hash algorithm. So this is where you put your message. So for example, I write, Hi, I am Dr. Diana Song Song. Take note that is your hash, right? So this is what we mean by that, okay? Take note that if I just put a period, what happened? The hash is completely different. Okay, so that's the hashing algorithm that we were talking about. But take note that the hashing algorithm, it's only a one-way function. Meaning to say, if you know this hash, you will not be able to get the original message. Okay?